Abandonment to Divine Providence, Part 3 Chapter 2, Section 12 The Divine Word, Our Model The divine action alone can sanctify us, for that alone can make us imitate the divine example of our perfection. In course of time, the idea formed by the eternal wisdom of all things is carried out by divine action. All things have, in God, their likeness, and are recognized and known by the divine wisdom. You should know all those things that are not for you. Such knowledge would be no guide to you in any way. The divine action beholds in the word the idea after which you ought to be formed, and this example is always before it. It sees in the word all that is necessary for the sanctification of every soul. The holy scriptures contain one part, and the working of the divine action in the interior of the soul, after the example set forth by the word, complete the work. We must understand that the only way of receiving the impression of this eternal idea is to remain quietly amenable to it, and that neither efforts nor mental speculations can do anything to that end. It is obvious that a work such as this cannot be affected by cleverness, intelligence, nor subtlety of mind, but only by the passive way of abandonment to its reception, and by yielding to it like metal in a mold, or a canvas under a pencil, or stone in the hand of a sculptor. It is evident that to know all the divine mysteries of God is by no means the way by which his will we are made to resemble his image. That image which the Word has formed of us, that our resemblance to the divine type can only be formed in us by the impression of the seal of the divine action, and that this impression is not produced by the mind by ideas, but in the will by abandonment. The wisdom of the just soul consists in being content with what it is intended for it, in confining itself within the boundary of its path, and not trespassing beyond its limit. It is not inquisitive about God's way of acting, but is content as regards itself with the arrangement of his will, making no effort to discover its meaning by comparisons or conjectures but only desiring to understand what each moment reveals. It listens to the voice of the word when it sounds in the depths of the heart. It does not inquire as to what the divine spouse has said to others, but is satisfied with what it receives for itself, so that moment by moment it becomes, in this way, divinized without its knowledge. It is thus that the Divine Word converses with his spouse, by the solid effects of his action which the spouse, without scrutinizing curiously, accepts with loving gratitude. Thus the spirituality of such a soul is perfectly simple, absolutely solid, and thoroughly diffused throughout its entire being. Its actions are not determined by ideas, nor by confusion of words, which by themselves would only serve to excite pride. Pri pious people make a great use of the mind, whereas mental exertion is of little use, and is even antagonistic to true piety. We must make use only of that which God sends to us, or to suffer. 
and not forsake this divine reality to occupy our minds with the historical wonders of the divine work, instead of gaining an increase of grace by our fidelity. The marvels of this work, of which we read for the purpose of satisfying our curiosity, often only tend to disgust us with things that seem trifling, but by which, if we do not despise them, the divine love effects great things in us. Fools that we are, we admire and bless this divine action in the writings relating its history. And when it is ready to continue this writing on our hearts, we keep moving the paper and prevent it writing by our curiosity to see what it is doing in and around us. Pardon, divine love, these defects. I can see them all in myself, for I, I am not yet able to understand how to let you act. So far as I have not allowed myself to be cast into the mold, I have run through all your workshops and have admired all your works, but have not as yet by abandonment received even the bare outlines of your pencil. Nevertheless I have found you a kind master, a physician, a father, a beloved friend. I will now become your disciple, and will frequent no other school than yours. Like the prodigal son, I return hungering for your bread. I relinquish the ideas which tend only to the satisfaction of mental curiosity. I will no longer run after masters in books, but will only make use of them as of other things that present themselves, not for my own satisfaction, but in dependence on the divine action and in obedience to you. For love of you, and to discharge my debts, I will confine myself to the one essential business, that of the present moment, and thus enable you to act. Book Two On the State of Abandonment Chapter One on the nature and excellence of the state of abandonment. Section 1. The Life of God in the Soul There is a time when the soul lives in God, and a time when God lives in the soul. What is appropriate to one state is inconsistent with the other. When God lives in the soul, it ought to abandon itself entirely to his providence. When the soul lives in God, it is obliged to procure for itself carefully and very regularly every means it can devise by which to arrive at the divine union. The whole procedure is marked out, the readings, the examinations, and resolutions. The guide is always at hand, and everything by the rule, even the hours of conversation. When God lives in the soul, it has nothing left of itself, but only that which the spirit which actuates it imparts to it at each moment. Nothing is provided for the future, no road is marked out, but it is like a child which can be led wherever one pleases, and has only feeling to distinguish what is presented to it. No more books with marked passages for such a soul. Often enough it is deprived of a regular director, for a God allows it no other support than that which he gives it himself. Its dwelling in darkness, forgetfulness, abandonment, death and nothingness. It feels keenly aware its wants and miseries without knowing from whence or when it will come 
its relief. With eyes fixed on heaven, it waits peacefully and without anxiety for someone to come to its assistance. God, who finds no purer disposition in his spouse than his entire self-renunciation for the sake of living the life of grace, according to the divine operation, provides her with necessary books, thoughts, insights into her own soul advice and counsel, and examples of the wise. Everything that others discover with great difficulty this soul finds in abandonment, and what they guard with care in order to be able to find it again, this soul receives at the moment there is occasion for it, and afterwards relinquishes so as to admit nothing but exactly what God desires it to have in order to live by him alone. The former soul undertakes an infinity of good works for the glory of God. The latter is often cast aside in a corner of the world, a bit like broken crockery, apparently of no use to anyone. There, this soul forsaken by creatures, but in the enjoyment of God by a very real, true, and active love, active although infused in repose, does not attempt anything by its own impulse. It only knows that it has to abandon itself and to remain in, in the hands of God to be used by Him as He pleases. Often it is ignorant of its use, but God knows well. The world thinks it is useless, and appearances give color to this judgment. But nevertheless, it is very certain that in mysterious ways, and by unknown channels, it spreads abroad an infinite amount of grace on persons who have no thought about it, and of whom it never thinks. In souls abandoned to God, everything is efficacious. Everything is a sermon, an apostolic. God imparts to their silence, to their repose, to their detachment, to their words, gestures, etc., a certain virtue which, unknown to them, works in the hearts of those around them and they are guided by the occasional actions of others who are made use of by grace to instruct them without their knowledge. In the same way, they, in their turn, are made use of for the support and guidance of others without any direct acquaintance with them or understanding to that effect. God it is who works in them by unexpected and often unknown impulses, so that these souls are like to Jesus, from whom proceeded a secret virtue for the healing of others. There is in this difference between him and them, that often they do not perceive the outflow of this virtue, and even contribute nothing by its cooperation. It is like a hidden balm, the perfume of which is exhaled without being recognized, and which knows not its own virtue. Section 2. The Most Perfect Way In this state the soul is guided by the divine action through every kind of obscurity. When the soul is moved by the divine influence, it forsakes all works, practices, methods, means, books, ideas, and spiritual persons in order to be guided by God alone by abandoning itself to that moving power which becomes the sole source of its perfection. It remains in his hands like all the saints, understanding that the divine action alone can guide it in the right path, and that if it were to seek other means, it would inevitably go astray 
in that unknown country which God compels it to traverse. It is, according to the action of God which guides and conducts souls by way which it alone understands, it is, with these souls, like the changes of the wind. The direction is only known in the present moment, and the effects follow their causes by the will of God, which is only explained by these effects because it acts in these souls and makes them act either by hidden undoubted instincts or by the duties of their state. This is all the spirituality they know. These are their visions and revelations. This is the whole of their wisdom and counsel insomuch that nothing is ever wanting to them. Faith makes them certain that what they do is well, whether they read, speak, or write, and if they take counsel it is only to be able to distinguish more clearly the divine action. All this is laid down for them, and they receive it like the rest, beholding beneath these things the divine motive power, and not fastening on things presented but using or leaving them, always leaning by faith on the infallible, unruffled, immutable, and ever efficacious action of God at each moment. This they perceive and enjoy in all things, at least as well as the greatest, for it is entirely at their service at every moment. Thus they make use of things not because they have any confidence in them, or for their own sake, but in submission to the divine ordinance, and to that interior operation which, even under ordinary appearances, they discover with equal facility and certitude. Their life, therefore, is spent, not in investigations or desires, weariness or sighs, but in a settled assurance of being in the most perfect way. Every state of body or soul, and whatever happens interiorly or exteriorly, as revealed at that moment to these souls, is, to them, the fullness of the divine action, and the fullness of their joy. Creating things are, to them, nothing but misery and dearth. The only true and just measure is in the working of the divine action. Thus, if it takes away thoughts, words, books, food, persons, health, even life itself, it is exactly the same as if it did the contrary. The soul loves the divine action and finds it equally satisfying under whatever shape it presents itself. It does not reason about the way it acts. It suffices for its approval that whatever comes is from the source. Section 3. Abandonment a pledge of predestination. The state of abandonment contains in itself pure faith, hope, and charity. The state of abandonment is a certain mixture of faith, hope, and charity in one single act, which unites the soul to God and to his action. United these three virtues, together form but one in a single act, raising to the heart of God, abandonment to his action. But how can this divine mingling, this spiritual oneness, can be explained? How can a name be found to convey an idea of its nature, and to make the unity of this trinity intelligible? It can be explained thus. 
It is only by means of these three virtues that the possession and enjoyment of God and of his will can be attained. This adorable object is seen, is loved, and all things are hoped for from it. Either virtue can with equal justice be called pure love, pure hope, or pure faith. And if the state in which we are speaking is more frequently designated by the last name. It is not that other theological virtues are excluded, but rather that they may be understood, do subsist, and be practiced in this state in obscurity. There can be nothing more secure than this state in the, in the things that are of God, nothing more disinterested than the character of the heart. On the side of God is the absolute certitude of faith, and on that of the heart is the same certitude tempered with fear and hope. O most desirable unity of the trinity of these holy virtues, believe, then, hope and love but by a simple feeling which the Holy Spirit, who is given to you by God, will produce in your soul. It is there that the unction of the name of God is diffused by the Holy Spirit in the center of the heart. This is the word, this is the mystical revelation, and a pledge of predestination with all its happy results. Quam bonus Israel, Deus his qui recto sunt corde. Psalm 72 This impress of the Holy Spirit in souls inflamed with his love is called pure love on account of the torrent of delight overflowing every faculty, accompanied by a fullness of confidence and light, but in souls that are plunged in bitterness, it is called pure faith because the darkness and obscurity of night are without alleviation. Pure love sees, feels, and believes. Pure faith believes without either seeing or feeling. In this is shown the difference between these two states. But this difference is only apparent, not real. The appearances are dissimilar, but in reality, as in the state of pure faith, is not lacking in charity. Neither is the state of pure love lacking in faith, nor in abandonment, the terms being applied according to which virtue prevails. The different gradations of these virtues under the touch of the Holy Spirit form the variety of all supernatural and lofty states. And since God can rearrange them in an endless variety, there is not a single soul that does not receive this priceless impress in a character suitable to it. The difference is nothing. They are the same faith, hope in charity and all. Abandonment as a general means of receiving special virtues in every variety of different impresses. Souls cannot all lay claim to the same sort, nor to a similar state, but all can be united to God. All can be abandoned to His action. All can receive the impress that is best suited to them. All, in fact, can live under the reign of God and enjoy a share in His justice with all its advantages. In this kingdom, every soul can aspire to a crown, and whether a crown of love or a crown of faith, it is always a crown, always the kingdom of God. There is this difference, it is true. The one is in light, the other in darkness. But, again, 
what does this signify if the soul belongs to God and obeys his will? We do not seek to know the name of this state, its characteristics, nor excellence, but we seek God alone and his action. The manner of it ought to be a matter of indifference to the soul. Let us therefore no longer preach to souls about either the state of pure love, or of perfect faith, the way of delights, or of the cross, for these cannot be imparted to all in the same degree, nor in the same manner. But let us preach abandonment in general to the divine action, to all simple souls who fear God, and let us make them all understand that by these means they will attain to whatever particular state chosen and destined for them by the divine action from all eternity. Let us not dishearten, nor rebuff, nor drive away any one from that most eminent perfection to which Jesus calls every one, exacting from them submission to the will of his heavenly Father, and thus making them his members of his mystical body. He is their head only in so far as their will is in accordance with his. Let us continually repeat to all souls that the invitation of this sweet and loving Savior does not exact anything very difficult from them, nor very extraordinary. He does not ask for talent and ingenuity. All he desires is that they have a good will and desire to be united to him, so that he could guide, direct, and befriend them in proportion as they are so united. Section 4. Abandonment, a source of joy. The state of abandonment comprises the most heroic generosity. There is nothing more generous than the way in which a soul having faith accepts the most deadly perils and troubles, beholding in them something divine of the spiritual life. When it is a question of swallowing poison, or filling a breach, of slaving for the plague-stricken, in all this they find a plenitude of divine life, not given to them drop by drop, but in floods which inundate and engulf the soul in an instant. If an army were animated by the same ideals, it would be invincible. This is because the instinct of faith is an elevation and enlargement of the heart above and beyond all that is presented to the senses. The life of faith and the instinct of faith are one and the same. It is an enjoyment of the goods of God and a confidence founded on the expectation of his protection making everything pleasant and received with good grace. It is indifference to, and at the same time a preparation for, every place, state, or person. Faith is never unhappy even when the senses are most desolate. This lively faith is always in God, always in his action and above contrary appearances by which the senses are darkened, the senses, in terror, cry aloud to the soul, Unhappy one, you have now no resource, you are lost. And instantly faith, with a stronger voice, answers, Keep firm, go on, and fear nothing. Section 5 the great merit of pure faith. By the state of abandonment in pure faith, the soul gains more merit than by the most eminent good works.
Whatever we find extraordinary in the lives of the saints, such as revelations, visions, and interior locutions, is but a glimpse of that excellence of their state, which is contained and hidden in the exercise of faith. Because faith possesses all this by knowing how to see and hear God in that which happens from moment to moment. When these favors are manifested visibly, it does not mean that by faith they have not already possessed, but in order to make the excellence of faith visible for the purpose of attracting souls to the practice of it. Just as the glory of Tabor and the miracles of Jesus Christ were not from any increase of his intrinsic excellence, but from the light which from time to time escaped from the dark cloud of his humanity to make it an object of veneration and love to others. That which is wonderful in the saints is the constancy of their faith under every circumstance. Without this there would be no sanctity. In the loving faith which makes them rejoice in God for everything, their sanctity has no need of any extraordinary manifestation. This could only prove useful to others, who might require the testimony of such signs. But the soul in this state, happy in its obscurity, does in no way rely on these brilliant manifestations. It allows them to show outwardly for the profit of others but keeps for itself what all have in common, the will of God, and his good pleasure. Its faith is proved in hiding, and not in manifesting itself, and those who require more proof have less faith. Those who live by faith receive proofs, not as such, but as favors from the hand of God, and in this sense things that are extraordinary and not in contradiction to the state of pure faith. But there are many saints whom God sets up for the salvation of souls, and from whose faces he causes rays of glory to stream for the enlightenment of the most blind. Of such were the prophets and the apostles, and all those saints chosen by God to be set in the candlestick of the church. There will ever be such, as there ever have been. This is also an infinity of others who, having been created to shine in the heavens, give no light in this world, but live and die in profound obscurity. Section 6. Submission a Free Gift to God The state of abandonment includes the merit of every separate operation. Abandonment as practiced interiorly contains every possible variety of operation, because the soul giving itself up to the good pleasure of God, this surrender affected by pure love, extends to all the operations of this good pleasure. Thus the soul practices at each moment an abandonment without limit, and in its virtue are comprehended all possible quantities and every method. It is, therefore, by no means the business of the soul to decide what is the object of the submission it owes to God. Its sole occupation is to submit at all times and for all things. What God requires of the soul is the essential part of abandonment. The free gifts he asks are abnegation, obedience, and love. The rest is his business. Provided that the soul carefully fulfills the duties of its state, provided it quietly follows the attraction given to it, 
and submits peacefully to the dealings of grace as to body and soul, it is in this way exercising interiorly one general and universal fact, that of abandonment. This act is by no means limited by time, nor by the special duty of the moment, but possesses in the main all the merit and efficacy which a good, sincere will always has, although the result does not depend on it. What it desired to do is done in the sight of God. If God's good pleasure sets a limit on the exercise of particular faculties, it sets none to that of the will. The good pleasures of God, the being and essence of God, are the objects of the will, and by the exercise of charity its union with God has neither limit, distinction, nor measure. If this charity ends in the exercise of the faculties for certain objects, it is because the will of God only goes so far. It contracts itself, so to speak, restricting itself to the exigencies of the present moment, and from whence it passes to the faculties, and then to the heart. Finding the heart pure, free, and without reserve, it communicates itself fully to it on account of the infinite capacity which charity has affected by emptying it of all creative things, thus rendering it capable of union with God. O heavenly purity! O blessed annihilation! O unreserved submission! Through you is God drawn into the center of the heart. Let the faculties be then what they will, provided, Lord, that I possess you. Do what you will with this insignificant creature, whether it works, becomes inspired, or becomes the subject of your impressions, it is all one. All is yours. All is from you and for you. I have no longer anything to look after, anything to do. I have no hand in this arrangement of one single moment of my life. All is yours. I ought neither to add to nor to diminish anything, neither, neither to seek after nor to reflect upon anything. It is for you to regulate everything. Direction, mortification, sanctity, perfection, and salvation are all your business, Lord. Mine is to be satisfied with your work, and not to appropriate any action or any state, but to leave all to your good pleasure. Section 7. Submission, a free gift to God. Every soul is called to enjoy the infinite benefits contained in this state. Therefore do I preach abandonment, and not any particular state. Every state in which the souls are placed by your grace is the same to me. I teach a general method by which all can attain the state which you have marked out for them. I do not exact more than the will to abandon themselves to your guidance. You will make them arrive infallibly at the state which is best for them. It is faith that I preach. Abandonment, confidence, and faith. The will to be subject to, and to be the tool of the divine action. And to believe that at every moment this action is working in every circumstance, provided that the soul has more or less good will. 
This is the faith that I preach. It is not a special kind of faith, nor of charity, but a special state by which all souls can find God under the different conditions which he assumes, and can take that form which divine grace has marked out for them. I have spoken to souls in trouble, and now I am speaking to all kinds of souls. It is the genuine instinct of my heart to care for all, to announce the secret saving far and wide, and to make myself all to all. In this happy disposition I make it a duty which I fulfill without difficulty, to weep with those who weep, to rejoice with those who rejoice, to speak foolishly with the foolish, and with the learned to make use of more learned and more scholastic terms. I wish to make all understand that although they cannot aspire to the same distinct favors, they can attain to the same love, the same abnegation, the same God in his work, and thence it follows naturally to the highest sanctity. Those graces which are called extraordinary and are given as privileges to certain souls are only so called because they are so few sufficiently faithful to become worthy of receiving them. This will be made manifest at the day of judgment. Alas, it will then be seen that instead of these divine favors having been withheld by God, it has been entirely by their own fault that these souls have been deprived of them. What untold blessings they would have received through the complete submission of a steadfast good will. It is the same with regard to Jesus as with the divine action. If those who have no confidence in him, nor respect for him, do not receive any of the favors he offers at all, they have only their own bad disposition to thank for it. It is true that all cannot aspire to the same sublime states, to the same gifts, to the same degree of perfection. Yet, if faithful to grace, they correspond to it, each according to his degree. They would all be satisfied because they would all attain that degree of grace and of perfection, which would fully satisfy their desires. They would be happy according to nature and according to grace because nature and grace share equally in the ardent desire for his priceless advantage. Section 8. God reigns in a pure heart. All the treasures of grace are the fruit of purity of heart and a perfect abandonment. He, therefore, who wishes to enjoy an abundance of all blessings, but had one thing to do, to purify his heart by detaching it from creatures, and to abandon himself entirely to God. In this purity and abandonment he will find all that he desires. May others, Lord, ask you for all sorts of gifts? May they multiply their words and prayers. As for me, my God, I ask only one single gift. I have only one prayer to make. Give me a pure heart. O oh, pure heart, how happy you are! For by the liveliness of your faith you see God as he is in himself. You see him in all things and at every moment working within you and around you. 
In all things you are his subject and his instrument. He rules you and leads you. You have not to think because he thinks for you. Whatever happens to you, or may happen by his will, it is enough for him that you will will it also. He understands your readiness. In your salutary blindness you try to discover in yourself this desire, but you cannot see it. Nevertheless he sees it quite clearly. How foolish you are! A well-disposed heart is a heart in which God dwells. Seeing, therefore, the good inclinations in this heart, God well knows that it will remain always submissive to his will. He knows also that you are ignorant of what would be useful to you, and therefore he makes it his business to give you what is necessary. It matters very little to him whether you are thwarted or not. If you imagine you are going east, he makes you go west. If you are about to strike a rock, he pushes the tiller and brings you into port. Without either, either map or a compass, wind or tide, the voyages you make are always fortunate. If you encounter pirates, an unexpected puff of wind instantly wafts you beyond their reach. O oh, good will, O oh, pure heart, Jesus well knew where to place you when he ranked you among the Beatitudes. What greater happiness can there be than to possess God, if he mutually possesses you? It is a state full of charm and of joy, in which the soul reposes peacefully in the bosom of divine providence where it sports innocently with the divine wisdom, feeling no anxiety about the journey which suffers no interruption, but in spite of rocks and pirates and constant storms, ever continues as happy as possible. O oh, pure heart! O oh, good will, the sole foundation of every spiritual state, to you are granted the gifts of firm faith, holy hope, perfect confidence and pure love, and by you are they made profitable. On your stem are grafted the flowers of this desert. In other words, from you spring those priceless graces which blossom in souls entirely detached, where God, as in an uninhabited dwelling, takes up his abode to the exclusion of all else. You are the faithful source from whence flow those streams like water the flower garden of the divine spouse and of his chosen one. Your voice calls all the souls of men, saying to them, Look well at me, it is I who impart fair love, that love which chooses the better part and lays hold of it. It is I who give birth to that fear, so gentle and efficacious. which produces a horror of evil and makes it easy to avoid. I, who bring to light those fine perceptions which are discovered the greatness of God and the value of virtue, in fine it is from me that those ardent desires take their rise, enkindled by holy hope. It is I who cause virtue to be practiced in expectation of the promised reward. That divine object of our love, the possession of whom will one day form the happiness of faithful souls, invite them all to come to you to be enriched with your inexhaustible treasures. 
all spiritual states and paths lead back to you. It is from you that they divide, derive all that is beautiful, attractive, and charming. For all is drawn from your depths. These marvelous fruits of grace and of every kind of virtue that helps to nourish the soul and that abounds on every side are produced by you. Milk and honey flow in your land. Your breast distill milk and on your bosom is the bouquet of myrrh from which, under the pressure of your fingers, the ar aromatic liquid flows abundantly. Let us go, then. Let us run and fly to that ocean of love by which we are attracted. What are we waiting for? Let us start at once. Let us lose ourselves in God, even in his heart, to become inebriated with the wine of his charity. We shall find in his heart the key of heavenly treasures. Let us begin at once our journey to heaven. There is no passage that we cannot discover. Nothing is shut against us, neither the garden, nor the cellar, nor the vineyard. If we desire to breathe the fresh country air, we can go on our own feet and return when we please. With this key of David we can enter and depart. It is the key of science, and of that abyss in which are contained all the hidden treasures of divine wisdom. With this heavenly key we also open the gates of mystical death with its sacred darkness. By it we descend into the deep pools and in, into the den of lions. By it, souls are thrust into these obscure prisons from whence they emerge unscathed. By it, we are introduced into that joyful place where light and understanding have their dwelling, where the spouse takes the midday rest in the open air, and where he reveals the secrets of his love to faithful souls. O oh, divine, incommunicable secrets that no mortal tongue can describe, since every good thing that it is possible to possess is given to those who love, let us love then, in order to be enriched by them. For love produces sanctity with all that accompanies it. It flows on every side, on the right hand and on the left, into those hearts open to receive this divine outpouring. O divine harvest for eternity, is it not possible to praise you sufficiently? And why speak so much about you? How much better to possess you in silence than to praise you with mere words? But what am I saying? You must be praised, but only because you take possession of us, for, from the moment you enter into possession of a heart, then reading, writing, speaking, or silence are matters of complete indifference. One can take or leave anything, live in solitude, or as an apostle. One is well or ill, dull or eloquent, in fact, anything that you will. That which you dictate, your faithful echo, the heart repeats to all the faculties. In that compound of matter and spirit, the heart, which you regard as your kingdom, you reign supreme, and as it has no other instincts than those which you inspire, 
all the things that you present are equally agreeable. Those things that nature or the devil wish to substitute cause nothing but disgust and horror. If you allow it to be occasionally overcome, it is only to make it wiser and more humble. But from the moment it realizes it, its mistake, it returns to you with renewed love and clings to you with greater tenacity. Chapter 2 The Duties of Those Souls Called by God to the State of Abandonment Section 1 Sacrifice The Foundation of Sanctity The first great duty of souls called by God to this state is the absolute and entire surrender of themselves to Him. Sacrifate sacrificium et sperate in domino. That is to say, that the great and solid foundation of the spiritual life is the sacrifice of oneself to God, subjecting oneself to his good pleasure in all things, both interior and exterior, and becoming so completely forgetful of self thereafter as to regard oneself as chattel, sold and delivered, to which one no longer has any right. In this way the good pleasure of God forms one's whole felicity, and is happiness, glory and existence, one's sole good. This foundation laid, the soul has nothing else to do but to rejoice that God is God and to abandon itself so entirely to his good pleasure that it feels an equal satisfaction in whatever else it does, nor ever reflects on the uses to which it is applied by the arrangements of this good pleasure. To abandon oneself, therefore, is the principal duty to be fulfilled, involving, as it does, the faithful discharge of all the obligations of one state. The perfection with which these duties are accomplished will be the measure of the sanctity of each individual soul. A saintly soul is a soul freely submissive, with the help of grace, to the divine will. All that follows on this free consent is the work of God, and not of man. The soul should blindly abandon itself to be indifferent about everything. This is all that God requires of it, and so to the rest he determines and chooses according to his own plans, as an architect selects and arranges the stones for the building he is about to construct. It is therefore of the first importance to love God and his will, and to love this will in whatever way it is made manifest to us, without desiring anything else. The soul has no concern in the choice of different objects. That is God's affair, and whatever he gives is best for the soul. The whole spirituality is an abridgment of the, this maxim, abandon yourself entirely to the overruling of God, and by self-oblivion be externally occupied in loving and serving him without any of those fears, reflections, examens, and anxieties, which put the affair of our salvation and perfect sometimes occasions. Since God wishes to do all for us, let us place everything in his hands once and for all, leaving them in his infinite wisdom, and, no, and trouble no more about anything but what concerns him. On then, my soul, 
on with head uplifted above earthly things, always satisfied with God, with everything He does, or makes you do. Take good care not to imprudently entertain a crowd of anxious reflections which, like so many trackless ways, carry our footsteps far and wide until we are hopelessly astray. Let us go through the labyrinth of self-love by leaping over it, instead of transversing its interminable windings. On my soul, through despondency, illness, aridity, uncertain tempers, weakness of disposition, snares of the devil and of men, through suspicions, jealousies, evil imaginations and prejudices. Let us soar like an e eagle above all these clouds with fixed eyes on the sun and on its ways, which represent our obligations. All this we must needs feel, but we must, at the same time, remember that ours is not a life of mere sentiment and that it does not depend upon us either to feel or to be callous. Let us live in the higher regions of the soul in which God and His will form an eternity over equal, ever the same, ever unchanging. In this dwelling entirely spiritual, and wherein the uncreated, immeasurable, and ineffable holds the soul at an infinite distance from all that is specific in shadows and created atoms, it remains calm, even when the senses are tossed about by tempests. It has become independent of the senses, their troubles and agitations and innumerable vicissitudes are no more affected than the clouds that obscure the sky for a moment and then fade away affect the sun. We know that all passes away like clouds blown along by the wind, and nothing is consecutive, not ordered but everything is in a state of perpetual change. In the state of faith, as in that of God, God in His will is the eternal object that captivates the heart, and will one day form its true happiness. And this glorious state of the soul will influence the material part, which at present is the prey of monsters and savage beasts. Beneath these appearances, terrible though they be, the divine action will so work on this material part as to make it partake of a heavenly power which will render it brilliant as the sun. For the faculties of the sensitive soul and those of the body are prepared here below like gold or iron or like the canvas for a picture or stones for a building. Like the matter of which these different materials are composed, they will not attain their brilliance and purity of form until they have passed through many alterations, have endured many deprivations, and survived many destructions. However they suffer here below under the hand of God serves to that end. The soul in a state of faith, which knows the secret of God, dwells always in peace. All that takes place interiorly, instead of alarming, reassures it. Deeply convinced that it is guided by God, it takes all that happens as so much grace, and overlooking the instrument with which God's work It thinks only of the work that he is doing. 
It is actuated by love to fulfill faithfully and exactly all its duties. All that is distinct in a soul abandoned to God is the work of grace, with the exception of those defects which are slight, and which the action of grace ever turns to good account. I call that distinct of which a soul receives a sensible impression either of sorrow or consolation through those things applied to it unceasingly by the divine will for its improvement. I call it distinct because it is more clearly distinguished by the soul from all else that takes place within it. In all these things faith only sees God and applies itself solely to become conformed to his will. Section 2. The Pains and Consolations of Abandonment The soul ought to strip itself of all things created in order to arrive at the state of abandonment. This state is full of consolation for those who have attained it, but to do so it is necessary to pass through much anguish. The doctrine concerning pure love can only be taught by the action of God, and not by any effort of the mind. God teaches the soul by pains and obstacles, not by ideas. This science is a practical knowledge by which God is enjoyed as the only good. In order to master this science it is necessary to be detached from all personal possessions. To gain this detachment, to be really deprived of them. Therefore it is only a co by constant crosses and by a long succession of all kinds of mortifications, trials, and deprivations that pure love becomes established in the soul. This must continue until all things created becomes as though they did not exist, and God becomes all in all. To effect this, God combats all the personal affectations of the soul, so that when these take any special shape, such as some pious notion, some help to devotion, or when there is any idea of being able to attain perfection by some such method, or such a path or way, or by the guidance of some particular person, in fine to whatever the soul attaches itself, God upsets its plan and allows it to find, instead of success in these projects, nothing but confusion, trouble, emptiness, and folly. Har hardly has it been said, I must go this way, I must consult with this person, or I must act in such a manner. Then God immediately says the exact contrary, and withdraws all the virtue usual in the means adopted by the soul. Thus, finding only deception and emptiness in everything, the soul is compelled to have recourse to God himself, and to be content with him. Happy the soul that understands this lovingly severe conduct of God, that corresponds faithfully with it. It is raised above all that passes away to repose in the immutable and the infinite. It is no longer dissipated among created things by giving them love and confidence, but allows them only when it becomes a duty to do so. Or when enjoined by God, and when his will is made especially manifest in this matter, it inhabits a reason above earthly abundance or dearth, in the fullness of God, who is its permanent good. God finds this soul quite empty of its own inclinations, of its own movements, 
of its own choice. It is a dead subject, enshrouded in universal indifference. The whole of the divine being, coming thus to fill the heart, casts over all created things a shadow, as if nothingness absorbed all absorbing all their distinctions and all their varieties. Thus there remains neither efficacy nor virtue in anything created, and the heart is neither drawn towards nor has any inclination for created things, because the majesty of God fills it to the utmost extent. Living in God in this way, the heart becomes dead to all else, and all is dead to it. It is for God, who gives life to all things, to revive the soul with regard to creation and to give a different aspect to all things in the eyes of the soul. It is the order of God which is this life. By this order the heart goes out towards the creature as far as is necessary or useful, and it is also by this order that the creature is carried towards the soul and is accepted by it. Without this divine virtue of the good pleasure of God, things created are not admitted by the soul. Neither is the soul at all inclined towards them. This dissolution of all things as far as the soul is concerned, and then, by the will of God, their being brought once more into existence compels the soul at each moment to see God in all things, for each moment is spent for the satisfaction of God only, and in an unreserved self-abandonment with regard to its relations to all possible created things, or rather to those created, or possibly to be created by the order of God. Therefore, each moment contains all. Section 3. The Different Duties of Abandonment The act of exercise of abandonment, either in relation to precept or to inspiration. Although souls called by God to a state of abandonment are much more passive than active, they, yet they cannot expect to be exempted from all activity. This state being nothing else but the virtue of abandonment exercised more habitually, and with greater perfection, should, like this virtue, be composed of two kinds of duty active accomplishment of the divine will, and the passive acceptance of all that this will pleases to send. It consists essentially, as we have already said, in the gift of our whole self to God to be used as he thinks fit. Well, the good pleasure of God makes use of us in two ways. Either it compels us to perform certain actions, or simply works within us. We therefore submit also in two ways, either by faithful accomplishment of its clearly defined orders, or else by a simple and passive submission to its impressions of either pleasure or pain. Abandonment implies all this being nothing else but a perfect sub submission to the order of God, as made manifest in the present moment. It matters little to the soul in what matter it is obliged to abandon itself, and what the present moment contains. All that is absolutely necessary is that it should abandon itself unreservedly, 
There are, then, prescribed duties to be fulfilled, and necessary duties to be accepted, and further there is a third kind, which also forms part of active fidelity, although it does not properly belong to works of precept. In this are comprised inspired duties, those to which the Spirit of God inclines the hearts that are submissive to Him. The accomplishment of this kind of duty requires a great simplicity, a gentle and cheerful hardiness, a soul easily moved by the breadth of directing grace. For there is nothing else to do but to give oneself up and to obey its inspirations simply and freely. So that souls may not be deceived, God never fails to give them wise guidance to indicate with what liberty or reserve these inspirations should be made use of. The third kind of duty takes precedence of all law, formalities, or marked out rules. It is what, in saints, appears singular and extraordinary. It is what regulates their vocal prayer, interior words, the perception of their faculties, and also all that makes their lives noble, such as austerities, zeal, and the prodigality of their self-devotion to others. As all this belongs to the interior rule of the Holy Spirit, no one ought to try to obtain it, to imagine that they have it, to desire it, nor to regret what they do not possess the grace to undertake this kind of work, and to practice these common virtues, because they are only really meritorious when practiced according to the direction of God. If one is not content with this reserve, one lays oneself open to the influences of one's own ideas and will become exposed to illusion.